Yes, so I'm so excited to have you here today. It's lovely you, to be with you. Thank you. Because you are the menopause fitness expert. You know a lot about it. Because you basically you've been working in uh, female health and fitness industry for 23 years. And you are a menopause fitness and health, ex health expert. And you're also a menopause speaker. And um, initially you were a trend as a nurse and teacher, isn't it? That's right. Yeah, I trained as a nurse in London at um, King's College Hospital and I worked in neonatal intensive care, which is Prem Babies, um, wow. as a sister in neonatal intensive care. But I always had a passion for teaching. So um, eventually when the nursing hours weren't quite right for me and I wanted to have time to have my family around me, I left and went and uh, retrained as a teacher and worked in further education. Yeah. Okay, that's great, yes. And what I love about you is that you are passionate about making fitness fun, functional, and female-orientated. And it's amazing because, you know, to be healthy, most people know that they have to eat the right food, but they don't realize how much the fitness side of things is important. And women tend to not like fitness, isn't it? I think it's something that um, people will often put off Till they absolutely have to do something about it unless they've had a passion for it for a long time so yeah. um, the women that I coach tend to fall into two camps they've always been interested in sport at school um, and therefore they're always trying to find ways of, of keeping fitness going in their life or people who have been reluctantly pushed into it by somebody who said you know you've got to do something um, but they're very nervous about it it doesn't come naturally to them I think it's probably the opposite of men who j would just do anything not to eat right and focus exclusively on sport. Like, you know, the only way to sort everything is sport, but then they realize actually it doesn't always work. So it's, it's, it's very interesting. You offer different types of fitness activities. Yes. And uh, this is quite impressive. So you offer online fitness classes specifically for women over 45. That's right. And I had a look at your website. You offer... 11 classes that's massive. 11 classes a week yes yeah do you run all the classes i do nine classes a week um <laughs> i love it i absolutely love it but the really good thing about being a woman over 45 doing your fitness is yes. that we don't have to do it for very long anymore for it to be really beneficial so you know in your 20s your 30s or you know even in my early 40s if, if we were thinking about fitness slots of time, you're generally thinking about an hour. You know, you do something, you do 12.30 and 1.30 or seven and eight or eight and nine, doesn't matter. But we think about it in an hour slot. And actually, we don't need to do that anymore. So it becomes much easier to fit fitness into your lifestyle without it being overly onerous in your head. Yeah. Mm. So how long do, do your sessions last? The, my most popular sessions, actually, are only 30 minutes. Um, you can do an awful lot in 30 minutes, but 30 minutes is the, is the most popular session that I run. Yeah. Oh, wow. And, and you, do you do them live or do you do recording as well? They are. Um, I teach them live, so people join me live, but people in my programs can catch up um, and do them at a time that suits them. Interestingly, um, I mean, always interested in people's opinion on this. Mm -hmm. I think that we engage in a fitness class because we feel accountable. So if somebody say, go a bit lower, do it a bit faster, mm. do it a bit harder, that for me is really motivating. But I know a lot of the people that I teach actually prefer to do it on catch up later. So if you ask to me, my opinion for my own personality would be, no, I've got to do it live, I've got to be part of the community. But a lot mm. of people say, no, actually they'd rather catch up later at a time that suits them. So. I'm still learning. I'm still learning about what people want all the yeah, time. Yeah, but it's, as you said, different type of personality, different needs. And some people, they might not just be able to do it when, it, when it's live because of work commitment. So it's great that you've got all these possibilities. Yeah. So that's, um, that's the, your classes. And you specifically designed a new one. So that's pretty excited. It's called Abs, Arms and Ass. <laughs> Three A's. <laughs> Three A's, yeah. And it's designed to help women get comfortable with strength training. And uh, how is it going? How is uh, the welcome for this new class? Um, it's been my most popular class ever, actually. 
I think, um, I think anybody who is going through the perimenopause or the menopause and trying to understand a bit more about their body will at mm -hmm. some point come across somebody telling them they've got to get strong. Okay. You can't, you can't be learning about this stage of our life mm -hmm. without having somebody say, it's really important for you to do strength work. And, um, a lot of people are terrified of it. Absolutely terrified. It's the, it's the thing that they find the most uncomfortable because they have visions of gyms and great big heavy weights or building muscle that they find very unattractive. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to do was put together a program which targets the right areas, the big muscle groups, because mm -hmm. we need to work those big muscles. Your yes. abs, well, not your abs, but your arms and your ass. Who doesn't want a toned ass? You know, we, we want that to look good, don't we? Mm -hmm. um, so my 30 minute class, yeah, abs, arms and ass. It does what it says on the tin. And it's been really popular and a little bit, you know, a bit different. So how many times a week do you run this class? It's twice a week, Mondays and Wednesdays. On a Monday, we use your own body weight because your mm -hmm. own body is a tool. You can use your resistance of your own body. Mm -hmm. And then on Wednesdays, we use weights, which could be tin cans, bottles of water, or weights, depending on what people have got. At okay. home. So it's online. Yeah. Yeah, great. And you mentioned also a program. It's actually a, on, a signature online coaching program. And it's called Move Over Menopause. And it lasts for 60 days. Yeah, we just started, we started last week, three times a year, I have a, an online program called Move Over Menopause. So it's a, a coaching program where I help women um, have a sort of transformation, a transformation from thinking in one way and mm -hmm. behaving in one way to sort of almost changing their roadmap. And so the transformation is almost a behavioral transformation, but with that mm. comes weight loss, increased fitness, sleeping better, feeling better, starting to laugh, all of those sorts of things. Last but not least, you founded uh, Ladies Only Running Club in Kent, so that's in the United Kingdom for those who uh, listen to, to us from abroad, and it's called Ladies Juggers Group, and you were the running coach of the year for the UK, sorry, I'm reading behind me, uh, in 2014, so that that's um, is it an another class on top of the 11 that you are offering each week or is it including? So basically, this is where I come from in Seven Oaks in Kent. I set up a, a running club for women who mm. wanted to learn how to run, but recreationally, not, not in a competitive way. I set it up yeah, 22 years ago um, because at that point there was nowhere for what I would call normal women, women who hadn't come through the world of athletics, mm. who wanted to use running as their way of being fit. Um, and that's something I've been doing for a long time. It's given me a lot of my experience working with women about the right use of language, about how to push people and how not to push them, mm. how to encourage them to be confident in their body. Um, and yes, I've, I've, that's, the running group continues. It's a, a big thing locally where I live, but it's played a big part in my understanding of women and what they need as they get older. Yeah. Mm. And, and is it all women or is it women uh, over 45? It's all women. The running club is all, all women. Yeah. Um, but I suppose they tend to um, be attracted to us when they're around 30, 35, something like that. Mm. And the eldest lady in, in the club is actually one of our coaches. She's an incredible dynamic woman. Um, so she does power walking with our ladies. And you know what's really interesting is that friendships are formed that last 10, 12, 15 years. They last through having babies, having mm. jobs, getting married, getting divorced people dying and mm. it's a it's a really strong community um and i, think I can women, imagine women we need that yeah i can imagine because they join because they have something in common yeah. and the fact that they keep meeting on a regular basis for on the good days and the bad days you know yes. and, and to share and and yeah that that builds a, a friendship like like you just yes. said but what made you decide to to move into the menopause fitness side of things um, in the middle of all of that 20 years, 23 years, I ran my own first aid training company. So I went out mm. and I delivered first aid training to anybody who needed it. And the running club ticked along um, beside it. 
but oh. it, in, instead of the running club being a little kitchen table thing it became my passion the place where i met people who i i adore and still adore mm. and those people they were 10 15 years older than when they first joined and what was right for them 10 or 15 years ago mm. was not right now and my nursing training kept coming back to me and saying we've got to look after these women who are now heading into their 40s or i've got to i've got to provide something that's right for them now so i actually went back and did some retraining and i've always called myself a nurse i'm a, i'm a born nurse but i went and retrained did some more training and set up a, a small element of my business which has now become my core business called midlife makeover helping women in the menopause get fit stay fit stay mobile strong active mm -hmm. and that's sort of so, how long ago did you launch this program uh six or seven years ago um initially oh, wow. i sort of played it a little bit small um and i was i get a bit embarrassed telling people what i do actually but i've given myself a talking mm -hmm. to and i've told myself if i don't start telling people now for the next couple of years mm -hmm. otherwise it'll be too late and nobody will ever know so you, so you were one of the very first one to bring you know menopause to the to to the forefront of yeah. everything because you know four years ago was pretty much when everything started but because you started six years ago we That's were like years. yes That's great and I'm I'm curious is menopause considered the third age or is it something what, what does uh, it mean. <laughs> Okay, what does it mean? I'm going to have to, and we can tag her later, tag a lady called Jenny Burrell or Michelle Lyons, who are the two ladies who taught, delivered, and inspired this course to me live in Houston in London six or seven years ago or whatever it was. Mm -hmm. they, they stood up there and they embraced the fact that there is another age to our lives. So you have puberty, you have pregnancy, and then mm. there is this delicious time where you are suddenly almost free. You're free to live perhaps the third part of your life. I think mm. um, the dictionary definition of third age is something like your golden years. But actually, um, you know, whether it's your golden years or not, it's like the third time in your life when suddenly, if you get it right, everything can go really well. And, oh, and, and that's where yes. their education came from. And they really inspired me, really inspired oh, me. Oh, okay, I understand. Because I, I had re read about the menopause being the second spring. Yeah. But never about the third age, because not every woman has you know, children. So that's why, but it, yeah, it, it makes sense. I mean, I love the idea that if you say, you know, if you get it right, then it's sorted for the rest. It's just like beautiful. And how did this training um, in menopause differ from the training um, that you do for women before menopause? Um, hugely differently, uh, hugely differently. If, if you're training as a PT or if you're training as somebody mm -hmm. who works in fitness, you're not having to have any kind of thought process about what the decline in hormones naturally mm -hmm. will do on your body. And therefore, I think about fitness and exercise as a way of you being as strong and as vibrant and as mobile and as pain free as you can. Mm -hmm. I am no longer coaching anybody to run their fastest marathon, to run their fastest 10K, to lift the most weight. I'm training people to be able to go to the toilet when they want to, to put things in their cupboards where they want to, mm -hmm. to get a shoe from under their bed without worrying about groaning and that sort of thing. Mm. That's, that's about being functional, basically. Absolutely, yeah. Being able, being able to, to function and do all the, the movements. And What do you think midlife women or women going through the menopause or postmenopausal should be focusing on? Because there are obviously many types of exercise. There is running, uh, there's uh, so cardio, strength, the hits like um, high intensity interval trainings, yoga, pilates, and so on. So do you have recommendation or is it what people i mean women like what you saying? what's your I opinion think, on that i think i have a very strong opinion i think there are three um things that women need to think about um with regards to their exercise they need to do something that makes them strong 
Um, mm -hmm. So lifting their own weight, whether that's resistance bands, their body weight, weights, weights, um, digging in the garden, you know, shoveling things because that's part of your job. Anything where you're using strength is really important. Mm -hmm. um, you have to get sweaty. So there's an S theme here, isn't there? You have mm -hmm. to do cardio in some way, shape or form. If your heart is not pumping so that you're puffing at some point, a couple of times a week, then your heart um, is not getting the exercise that it needs. And with the estrogen flowing, um, going down, mm -hmm. we need to nurture our hearts. We need to look after them because they're not protected in the same way as I'm sh absolutely sure you know. Um, so something that makes you sweaty. So that could be dancing, it could be Zumba, it can be paddle boarding, it doesn't matter. It can be sex, if that's what you wanna do to get nice and sweaty. Um, and then you have to have something, if we're following the S theme, so we've done strength, and we've done sweat, which is cardio. Something slow, so restorative movement is just as important. And as a runner, a marathon runner, I didn't really understand the link between yoga or Pilates or Tai Chi and, and exercise. It didn't, it didn't really click with me for quite mm. a while. Um, I now obviously understand the benefits of bringing your cortisol down and that has an effect on weight as absolutely I'm sure you know but it took me a, a while to embrace that so the three things that you need to concentrate are strength sweat cardio and slow restorative movement and how, what you do for those things is entirely up to you it's so you've got you... to love it though yeah Otherwise, in the, on the, in the long term, you, it's right. not going to happen. So yeah. do you recommend like one third, one third, one third? Or? Um, I think the people that I tend to coach, um, I, I, there's, I've nearly always got two answers for that. If mm -hmm. people come to me with a yoga background, which often they do, they're very comfortable with doing yoga, they would do yoga two or three times a week, then that's fine if that's comfortable for them. And I try and get them to do two strength sessions and two mm. cardio sessions, whether that's walking the dog or, or whatever. But you, it takes a while to think, gosh, there's four more things I've got to think about. It, it, you can't get your head around that overnight. And then equally, people will come to me with a marathon background or a strength background, and I've got to switch their, I've got to switch their brain into embracing the fact that I'm gonna tell them almost to lie terribly still for an mm. hour, and they're gonna think, whoa, what's the good of that? So it's small babies. <laughs> yeah. Why, why is that going to benefit me? And those people, if that's you, are much more challenging. Actually, I completely understand how it's going to benefit me. It's just that I find it too slow and very repetitive and, yeah. and I get bored. At least when I run, it's my favorite, running is my favorite exercise. When I run, I just go outside, I see, you know, the th scenery, I breathe fresh air or, you know, the rain, whatever, but in the, yeah. and I clear my mind. But when I, when I do yoga, I don't like Pilates for some reason, but when I do yoga or yoga session, you know, I have to have someone to teach me. And yeah. the fact that it's always the same poses in the same order and everything, and my mind just like switch off, from the voice and then yeah. I'm lost. It's just and like, in that case, it's challenging. In, <laughs> in that case, it may be for you that you would do a run walk in the forest without your watch, running watch, without any kind of care for speed or duration. And your restorative movement comes from a very different source, sort of forest bathing, but you know, not quite as still. Um, you know, you've got to find what you love. For me, yeah. it would be ballet. I actually want to start online ballet again. Um, I used to do a lot of ballet years and years ago. And there's something about the music for me that's terribly calming, um, but it's movement. So, you know, and, and what mm. suits you in your 40s may be different from your 50s, 60s and 70s. So we have to be aware of that too. It might change. Yeah. I am fully aware of that. Um... <laughs> And how often do you think we should exercise? Every day. Every day. No rest okay. day. You, you, you want a little bit of an addendum to that, don't you? We should be moving yeah, every yeah. day. And so I think really let's think about this more as movement. We should be getting 
daily movement, 20 minutes outside. I think everybody should clean their teeth standing on one leg. So you're working on your balance every single day. I mm -hmm. think that there is scope for us to have movement snacks, I call them, every single day, which is different potentially from how often might you go to a class and be coached, which mm -hmm. I would say anywhere between two and five times a week, depending on what floats your boat, to be honest. Yes, of course, you do need a rest day, but a rest is not not moving. A rest is not stuck to the sofa. Totally, totally agree. Do you have a tracker? Like, um... Um, yes, I do. I have, I'm a bit of a show off actually. I have a beautiful watch made by a company called Withings because I wear a Garmin when I run, which gives me my cadence and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. But actually, I wanted something that was quite beautiful on my arm because when I had a Fitbit, I didn't, it didn't look very nice with my jewelry. So it take, mm. took me a while to find something that I felt looked nice if we ever wear a dress again. Um, you know, looks <laughs> oui, nice, oui. <laughs> nice with jewellery um, and you can change the strap on it. But it gives me my, um, my overall steps. It doesn't really give me running statistics detailed enough if I was training. But for what I'm doing now, it does. Mm. Because what's really interesting is if you ask people how far they walk a day, they often hugely underestimate it. If you, oh, okay. if you say aim for yeah. 10,000 steps a day, most people, unless they're consciously thinking about it, they won't get anywhere near that. And we, we need that. What is your favorite type of exercise now? It was interesting, actually. I was, somebody asked me that the other day and I was, I was thinking about it. You know what? Running is my passion because it takes me back to a historical, I suppose, change in my life. The, the reason I started running. But the mm -hmm. thing that makes me feel sexy and strong and sassy is the weights. You, you know, it, you get your weights out and you start doing some of this stuff. I'm not saying it's easy, but the feel good factor is really high. Do you mean do your, your feel sexy while you're doing it or after you've done the session? But because I hate doing weights. Do I you? do it when the gyms are open, but what I really enjoy is just leaving the gym knowing that I'm, you know, I've pushed some weight, I've pushed myself and it was burning yeah. and now I feel like strong. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. I suppose um, for me, I, a lot of, I mean, I do train on my own, but obviously I'm, I'm training to a certain extent when I'm teaching. Mm. And for me, I get a massive smile on my face. If I've got 25 ladies in front of me and they give me the foulest looks, right? We're just doing that <laughs> once more. And I get the most awful looks and it makes me happily smile, <laughs> you know, that I'm inspiring them and they don't want to do it, but they do want to do it. And we all feel good afterwards. So, yeah, I, it's, it's a tough one to, to choose between running and the strength stuff, actually. Why well, you can what have I, two lots. <laughs> yeah. What I wish I could do is I wish I could play tennis and I can't hit the bloody ball. I'm, you know, I'm useless. If somebody says, do you want to play tennis after they've had a glass of champagne at lunch? I sort of think, oh gosh, how embarrassing. <laughs> I'm a useless swimmer. I always breathe at the wrong bit. Um, you know, there's lots of things I can't, I can't, my hand-eye coordination is rubbish. Um, and so, you know, I always do want to learn things, but you know, you can only do what you can do, can't you? How much does exercise impact um women going through the menopause in terms of symptoms, um, like uh, hot flushes, I know it has an impact, and also the, the mindset, the, you know, things going through the head. Yeah. Um, well, if we start with the sort of the clinical effect mm -hmm. of bone density, so um, how do we describe this? If you, if you take a whisper bar, you know, a whisper chocolate bar, and then you take an aero chocolate bar, you cut them down the middle, the arrow's got much bigger holes than the whisper. And that's mm. in effect what happens to our bones. So by doing this strength and resistance impact work, you're making your bones go back from being a potential arrow back to a whisper. Uh, it's always chocolate because I love chocolate. So there's the bone density. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with you. So, um, so do you mean that uh, on, on the bone density, do you mean that we don't necessarily need HRT to preserve our bone density or to build our bone density? I am never going to say you don't need HRT. I'm never going to say you have to have it because I, everybody should have a choice. I, I, I agree. Think, my, I my, think, my question was, I mean, 
you, you're not a GP, I'm not a GP, so we're not here to, 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 to say what other women should be doing. But in your opinion, from your experience and, and, and your research, do you think we can keep, because HRT has been proven to help with bone density, but for the women who choose or who can't take HRT by doing some strength uh, exercises on a regular basis, do you think they can still pre preserve their bone mass density? That's how I wanted to phrase it, if, if it didn't come across this way. No, that's fine. That's a great question. I had a lady who came to me to start my strength classes probably about five or six years ago. She was a lady in her early 60s and she had osteoporosis. She was on all sorts of medication. Her daughter was a physio and her daughter had said, come on, I really think you need to do this, mum. Within nine months of doing the exercises, that she did with me, but she could have done them with anybody. She came off all medication. Her bones had reverted back to what was seen as normal for her age. And so I'm absolutely 100% that done in the right way, you can have a massive impact on your bones. Yes. Wow, such a good success story. It was, yeah, absolutely. And, and um, are there other um, symptoms on which um, exercise can really make a difference? Um, well, I think a, it's cardio protective. If you're mm -hmm. so, you, you know, we talked about that. I think yeah. that's important to do to talk about. Um, and I mean, definitely the fact that the more muscle you're building helps mm. with weight control, not necessarily weight loss, but mm. weight control because your metabolic rate goes up and the calories in the chocolate and the champagne, which are so dear to me, <laughs> are allowed to, to, to come and go. But I think probably there's three main things that it's quite difficult to quantify, but in my experience are massively improved. Your focus and, and your concentration in the workplace. Um, mm. It has been proven that um, exercise where you're working in these big muscle groups will give you about two hours extra boost of concentration afterwards. Oh. Um, so that's massive. You know, if you do something short at lunchtime and something short in the morning, put you then in a workplace, your productivity is going to go up, your focus and your concentration. I think that the women who regularly exercise feel more confident mm -hmm. and your confidence definitely goes in the menopause. Mm -hmm. um, so across the board, I think it helps with that. And my biggest problem, which people may not actually believe, in the last two or three years has been anxiety over nothing, over mm -hmm. my husband driving too fast, over the dog running into the road. And my stomach churns. And in fact, as soon as I've done some kind of exercise, that's gone. Mm. And so anxiety, I think, is massively important mm. um, or the link between exercise and anxiety. Yeah, I, I, about that, this, I read an article saying that anxiety is usually highest in the morning yes, because of the cortisol, cortisol level and right. all the links with the hormones. I'm not going to get technical here, but basically, um, so it's, it's been proven that usually anxiety is highest in the morning for women going through the menopause. And that exercising in the morning really helps with dealing with anxiety for the rest of the day. So yes, I thought that's um, probably what you're doing anyway, because you have so many, so many sessions. A couple yeah. of weeks ago in my Instagram feed, I did Monday through to Friday, I did five, um, five minute fitness hacks. So just mm -hmm. something that you can do either first thing in the morning or at some point during your day. Because if you're new to it, and I tell you, you can do something that's worthwhile in five minutes, you're more likely to embrace it. Um, Absolutely. So I think it's, it's really important. Not everybody wants to put their lycra on like you and I do and go rushing off into the streets. So it's got to be doable for them too. Mm. Um, and five minutes, you know, if that's what you've got, go for it. Absolutely. Um, do you think that exercise alone can help with menopause? Exercise have, alone? Yeah, exercise, I, exercise, movement, you know, the fitness side of things is sufficient to help with deal with the symptom or you, we need to add, you know, the nutrition, the stress management, the good sleep. I mean, as in sleep. I think, so I think in honesty, it has to be, it has to be everything. I think nutrition and mm -hmm. exercise are right at the core of a healthy third age. I think um, when you then bring in the sleep and the rest and the anxiety, coping mechanisms you've then got a fairly tight mm. um, toolkit if you like of things that can help you and if you are 
that person who wants to then add HRT into the mix, that you are then having the, the best options for you in that circumstance to keep you healthy. Exercise mm -hmm. alone, I think is not good enough. Nutrition alone, I don't think is good enough. And it's not good enough alone just to have lovely candles wafting around at home and hope everything's going to be okay. <laughs> you need a little bit of everything, don't you? I totally agree with you, but I wanted your, your opinion. And, I think um... if you take something really simple like constipation, so a, yeah. a midlife woman, will often be constipated. So mm -hmm. her pelvic floor is slightly compromised. She may be slightly dehydrated. As soon as she becomes constipated, then um, there is a possibility that the, the hormone sort of fluctuations in her body are not working in the same way as they should. Add some movement into it, add some extra fluid into it, get this person moving and mm -hmm. feeling better. The constipation starts to go away. Their hormone levels start to balance out better. So you can't separate one thing from another. And I think just going back to it, you asked about my online program. That's mm. why I think you have to have somebody who encourages you to think about all the different elements of this health thing rather than just one element. Yeah. Um, Do you mind sharing a few, a few elements about your, your own menopause journey? No. Yes. What do you want Thank to know? Um, how did that happen to you? As in, did it go smoothly? Because obviously you, you know what to do. You were aware of probably it happening. You were in this industry. So, yeah. Mm. <laughs> tell okay. me whatever you want to tell me. It's very personal. So No, no. I, I have no problem telling you. I actually think that in some ways menopause or perimenopause, perimenopause is a retrospective diagnosis. So the more you learn, the more you read, the more you start to think about yourself rather than, you know, other people that you might be talking to, the more you think, oh, gosh. So actually, I only remembered this last week, Severin. When I was training for my last marathon, and we're talking a long time ago now, in late mm -hmm. 40s, there was a period of time where when I was really dizzy and I was actually running in a wobbly fashion and I went mm. into hospital and I had brain scans and everything was absolutely fine. I now know that we can get unexplained dizzy spells in perimenopause. Mm -hmm. That hasn't occurred to me at all. The biggest early warning that I was in a perimenopausal state was that my anxiety in the car with my husband went through the roof. I found he's, he's a, a police officer. He's a very safe mm. driver but he would be driving at 32 miles an hour and I'd be telling him to slow down. I'd be hanging onto the door. Mm. I'd be putting my foot through the footwell, trying to brake when I was a passenger. And I thought, this is not normal. And so it was those sorts of things. So I knew about the physical changes, mm -hmm. but I didn't really identify with the behavioral changes because menopause is such an individual thing, isn't it? You know, it, it, some people lose all desire for sex. Some people get utterly exhausted. Some people lose all their confidence. It's very, very individual. So whilst we can have a list of 32 things that it might be, it's only when you relate that, overlay that onto your life that you begin mm. to think, oh, yes, that's my version of that. That's my version of, of how that anxiety manifests itself. Put me on a stage with 500 people in front of me. I love it ask me to do something else well you know drive in, my, in the car with my husband and I was a nervous strike so you know it's interesting what about you what was your first sign uh, my first sign was extremely dry eyes yeah and um that was very surprising because I had that in the past but I was when I had um, eye laser surgery to remove right. my glasses obviously I had got them back <laughs> every time I study too hard <laughs> And um, and that was really weird because it came out of nowhere, no no reason. No um, and yeah, okay, so I thought, okay, fine. And then at the same time, I started waking up a bit earlier than usual and in sweats. But you know, yeah. it was winter, and I, I've got something with the heating which didn't, uh, which has n never been easy. So it was like, okay, so that's weird. Two two things, and there was a, another one which was anxiety. Yeah. I never had anxiety in my life. 
uh, stress I know, but anxiety never. Yes. Yeah. And so I had to figure out what it was, and then I put the name anxiety, and then I went to Dr. Google, <laughs> and Google helped me. And this is weird because I had just learned about it like two years prior during the um, during the my my nutrition diploma. So I. I learned about it. It's just that I felt I was too young for it. Yeah, I just yeah. had a baby and I was like, well, maybe, you know, it was just being a new mom, not sleeping enough. Yeah. And I just, well, actually, yeah, that, that's maybe that, but it's probably something else. And uh, yeah, no, and I've been lucky because I've been working on the symptoms and, and, and the lifestyle. So everything we discuss, you know, what I eat. Yes. Yeah. making conscious effort to sleep properly, moving and um, dealing with stress. Yeah, and, all, the, all uh, the right that's... things. Well, all, all the things, trying lots of things that work, seem to work for me. And yeah. what I think works the best is being able to track what I do. So I do a lot of yes. journaling yes. and I use my ooring really, uh, really important for me to track the movement, the sleep and and to know, to know if I eat um, a high protein, high fat diet, I mean, a meal in the evening, does it make a difference from, you know, a big plate yeah, of, exactly. uh, of uh, pasta and, and, and yeah, it's, 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 yeah. Uh, it's about trialing, you know, and, and, and journaling because everyone yeah. is different. So what works for me yes, might work for a client, but yeah. not at the same time because we don't come from the same place originally. You know, I've started looking after my health like a long time ago, so I've got already a good based keep reading everything you can yes. and then talking to other women because the more we can talk about this really openly if you know if one person picks up one thing from mm. one thing somebody said that helps them then it's yes. worth it isn't it well thank you so much for for all that um i've got three more questions that i ask all my guests Ooh, the first right. one is uh, knowing what you know today what do you wish you knew five years ago it could be related to menopause or not so I wish I'd had the courage of my convictions to follow the way that I wanted to work rather than doing what I thought people wanted me to do, is perhaps oh, the answer to the question. So it's been, it's been a blessing then. For me, fantastic. Yes, it has. I mean, hard on, work. On, on, on that level, because I'm yeah. sure there are. Yeah. Not everyone is a blessing about no. No? The, Absolutely. The, the COVID and the lockdown situation. Um, the next question is more related to menopause uh, this time. Um, what is the best tip you would keep, give our listener when it comes to um, menopause? Um, mm, 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 mm. I would say move every day is really important. Um, stand on one leg <laughs> every day. And in fact, I actually now think as women, my best tip for a woman learning, in the, learning about the menopause is to talk to somebody. Mm. I actually think, yes, I did start doing this possibly a few years before everybody did start talking about it much more openly. If mm. we can all talk and share and be more open, whether it's at work or at home or on a dog walk or wherever we are, then more people will feel more comfortable to ask more questions and more women will get help. Do you think, so do you think it's easy to talk about it? I do, but I think I'm in the minority. I think a lot of women are very um, um, embarrassed to talk about it. They feel like they're going to be judged. I think I move in circles where people are comfortable to talk about it, but I have to be, I can't be naive to think that that is a, you know, across the board. Um, because, because some people don't want to talk about it yet. The, men, the M word, no, I'm not ready for that. Mm. And that's fine. But I mean, I completely understand where you're coming from and I think Perhaps for you, it's easy to just to talk about it because it, it is what you do. So it's it's your your passion, you know, taking over your life. But I can imagine someone who has a um, regular kind of job, you know, who yeah. doesn't need to discuss, you know, anything personal. That would be really probably difficult to share very personal information to to their colleagues or or even to their friends. I mean, I, I am 46 and I never discuss, discuss menopause with my friends because even though they know that, you know, I, I specialize in that and, and I, I don't feel like, you know, I, sh I should be doing it. So this is, yeah, this is interesting. Um, I think it's people not feeling comfortable listening. Yes, Jo. Um, I think there's, there is that statement, isn't there? We have one mouth <laughs> and two ears. So if people are talking, then people can choose to listen or not. 
And mm. I think that's important. Yeah. So if I am, you know, if you ask me personal questions, um, because we are happy to talk about these things, and somebody learns something from something that you ask me, then I think that's fine. But the other thing that I think for me is important is I called my business the midlife makeover mm -hmm. because I know at 42, I didn't really understand about the menopause for me. The M word was something that happened to other people. Mm -hmm. Whereas at midlife, there comes a point we're all going to get hopefully to what well, we'll get to the middle of our life, wherever it is. Mm -hmm. But it's at that point that you suddenly think, OK, it's time to me to think about my health in a different way. So um, I think I think the more we talk, the better. No, I, I agree. It's just like, I just, by talking with you, I just realized that I don't mind talking about it with people who are in the same fields as me. Yes, but, but not with me, your friends. I, and I, I don't mind talking about me. My health is just like, honestly, an open book. But, uh, but proactively sharing that with my friends is something that I actually I don't do. And yeah. and I have no reason not to do it. And no excuse. Yeah. It's just, yeah. Perhaps I've left you with a challenge tonight. Well, <laughs> actually, yeah. This has been a real, for me, this has been a, an amazing conversation because now I'm like, perhaps, you know, I should be doing it a lot more because maybe they're not aware or maybe they, I, I, I don't know. I, yeah, thank you. Thank you no so problem. Much. And uh, my very last question is, um, so with regards to supporting women going through the menopause or women in midlife, who do you think I should interview next? Well, I met a lady going to, um, in Malawi a couple of years ago called Siobhan. Um, she, her Instagram tag is Siobhan Shavoff. And when I met her, she told me that when we got back from Malawi, she was going to sell everything she owned and she was going to get a camper van and she was going to drive around England and she was going to go and just learn a little bit more about herself, about this beautiful country that we live in and see what happened. And obviously there was a global pandemic. So she got stuck in the field in various mm -hmm. places, but she talks about, she doesn't talk about anti-aging because she says it's a, it's a blessing for us to be able to get older, but she talks about pro-aging. She was a journalist. She's mm -hmm. um, an inspirational woman. And I think she'd be a great person for you to talk to. Yeah, I'd love to. Uh, she sounds great. So thank you so much for, for all, you know, this chat. People get, can I get um, hold of you uh, via, uh, via Instagram message. And your ha handle is Sampal Midlife Makeover, isn't it? Sampal Midlife Makeover, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you, you yeah, offer... Like and, and you offer a free tester class uh, to see if... Um, Online business is fun, convenient, and, and you can seek, um, hold them accountable. And uh, unfortunately, you just started your program, so maybe for the next, uh, the next intake. W when is the next one you're yeah. starting? I'll be running the next intake in September, um, okay. but people tend to like to get to know me a little bit beforehand. So if somebody's interested in the online fitness classes and they want to join me for a free trial one, pop me a message via the Instagram page. Yeah, I'd love to have you. Great. Well, thank you so much, Sam, for your time today. And um, thank you very much for having me. It's been a really lovely chat.